morning. I told Hannah when we were on our way to church this morning, I said, I worked really hard on this one. We might make 15 minutes. So <laughs> that's my, that's my goal at least. So, you know, 10 minutes, 15, 20, no more than that. We'll see. But, uh, I took a little different approach this morning. Usually I try to do something topical. I see something interesting and it makes me think of something I could apply to a lesson. And I try to focus on that. And, you know, usually it's like a a YouTube video about some really interesting thing I noticed, but today I decided just to keep it simple and just do a passage study. So today we're going to be in John 16, and that's where we're going to be. We'll be bouncing around to some other, you know, side passages, but that'll be where the, the main of the lesson comes from. Starting in verse 1, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. So the beginning part, of course, is just really a warning to the, the apostles, the disciples, about what is going to be coming after Jesus' death. And in Acts chapter 26... Verses 9 through 11, Paul speaking, of course, says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all of the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging, raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So this is, of course, referring back to his days of Saul. And I just think it's interesting that John 16 specifically says they will put you out of the synagogues. And that is exactly what Saul claimed to be doing back in the day when he was doing that. And he even goes as far to say that he persecuted them to foreign cities, meaning that this wasn't just something Paul picked up in a local, you know, I'm going to make my local area not, you know, believe in Jesus of Nazareth and punish those that do. But Paul took it to the extreme where he went around and he did this even to places that were foreign to him. And that just shows how serious Paul was before he turned his life around on the road to Damascus. And in Acts chapter 21, this verse shows Paul's complete 180. Verses 30 through 33 saying, Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, Word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. It's a sad, you know, and I, I did some research into how Paul died, and I don't think there's any, you know, 100% proof evidence. I read Beheaded. But the Bible doesn't say anything about the passing of Paul and what happens to him. But I think, as you can see from this uh, verse where it says he inquired who he was and what he had done, Paul was honest. Paul had no denial of his faith for Jesus Christ and who he was and the complete 180 that he had done. And Paul, throughout all of his testaments, was, of course, honest about what he had did before. And I think that's inspiring at the least, just to kind of show the 180 that Paul did. And back in John, John 16 now. The last verse, but I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is kind of a reoccurring theme that Jesus told the disciples many times when he addresses the fact that he will soon be leaving them. Back in John 14, verses 28 through 29, he says, You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. <clears throat> and in Matthew 5, 10, one from the Sermon on the Mount we just studied, it says, uh, blessed are those that are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I think this is just comfort to the disciples. You know, it says, I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And I wonder if when the apostles 
were at that time in their life where they're starting to get persecuted. They're starting to get arrested. I think I read somewhere that 10 or 11 of them were martyrs. And, you know, of course, that's according to historical documents, not the Bible. So do some research into that on your own. But 10 or 11 of them martyrs mean they died for their faith. And I wonder if at that time, when that was happening to them, if they remembered these words that Jesus spoke to them, saying, in the hour that, that these things start to happen to you, remember that I told them to you. And they'll remember their faith in Jesus and who he was and how he led them to where they were exactly at that moment. And if they still had that you know, dying faith, and I'm sure they did because they died for their faith, but they remembered it and it comforted them. And we have that same comfort when we die. You know, We'll get that to the end. But continuing in John 16, verse 5, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It was also a reoccurring theme with the disciples that whenever Jesus would say, I'm going to him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? Before this passage, plenty of times when Jesus has said that, a lot of the disciples had asked, well, where are you going? In uh, John 13, a few verses, a few chapters ahead, verses 33 through 36, Jesus tells them, little children, yet a little while I'm with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I've loved you, you are also to love one another. But this is all people, you will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And this is interesting, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. So Peter, after hearing that, Peter didn't say, Lord, we will love one another as you have loved us. He didn't say that, he said, Lord, where are you going? Because a lot of the times when the disciples heard that Jesus was leaving, I'm sure it was really overwhelming to them. And it was really, I, I, I guess, maybe discouraging that Jesus would no longer be with them because they had spent so much of their life following him. So a lot of the times when Jesus tells them that he is leaving and then he tells them a lesson, the lesson is often over time overlooked because it was foreshadowed with, I will soon be leaving you. And they kind of just bypassed all that part. And it's something we need to work on as well. You know, take the whole Bible. Don't just focus on certain parts. Something that, you know, we cannot, of course, relate to, but an interesting thing that they did whenever they were confronted with that. And verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. I would imagine that's a tough pill to swallow, because this is, of course, chapter 16 is right before you know, the crucifixion, really close to it. And I would imagine that whenever the apostles are seeing this, if verses like this or quotes like this from Jesus pop in their head to where it says, it is to your advantage, to your advantage that this happens. I would just imagine that that's a tough pill to swallow. And it's even a tough pill to swallow for us when we sit up here on Sunday morning and think of the Lord's Supper, uh, you know, partake of the bread and the juice and remember the cruel death that Jesus had on the cross. But I just, I sympathize with them in that time because they're seeing it happen. Well, some of them, I think John saw it happen, but they were all there. And they remember him saying, it is to your advantage that this happens. It's just kind of hard to think about that something like that is happening to our advantage. You know, we benefit from that because it just seems like such a negative, negative part of Jesus' life. But we, of course, know that without it, we would never have a home in heaven with, with him and God. So but I just imagine what their thoughts were whenever that was happening, if that was hard. First John 4, 9 through 10 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Kind of just a touching message of Jesus's last words to the apostles. One of the last words. Back in chapter 16, starting again in verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So let's just kind of break down the big three right there. I mentioned sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
So sin because people do not believe in me. First John chapter three, verses four through six says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Kind of a breakdown to the words of, do you live in Jesus Christ? Does he live in you? The answer is, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. So if you are living in sin, you are not living in Jesus Christ. Kind of a breakdown you know, kind of a fact check, if you want. And it says no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. If you continue to live a life in sin, I would maybe think, like, do you actually understand, you know, the message that was preached? You know, if you continue to live in sin and you know it's a sin and you continue to do so, is that, are you living the way you should be? And of course the answer is no. Righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, Luke 5 uh, verse 21 says, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And it's also a reoccurring theme that the Pharisees doubted the righteousness of Jesus throughout the whole, a lot of the you know first four books of the New Testament. It, there's a lot of talk about the Pharisees trying to trick Jesus, not tricking, but trying to get him to, let's say, do work on the Sabbath and doubting him, saying that that's wrong. But that wasn't Jesus' pur uh, purpose on this earth. His purpose was to come and rewrite and, you know, retell and show us the example that he was supposed to be. And at the end of the day, uh, I think in Matthew, one of the chapters in Matthew, it talks about Jesus performs a miracle. And the apostles, I think it was Peter at the time, said, you know, Lord, be careful. You know, we are, you know, we're offending the uh, Pharisees. But Jesus wasn't here to appease to the Pharisees, you know, laws and the, rules that they had made and lived by, you know, you know, people of the old law. You know, Jesus wasn't here to please them. And at the end of the day, you know, they're the ones that ran and told Jesus or told and uh, got him arrested. But I mean, that's the beauty of it. You know, Jesus, he did what was right no matter what. He offended some very high up people. But, you know, we, sh we should be the same. We should be willing to do the same, stand up for our faith. And if and if there's anything that ever comes with that, you know, we should be willing to. Hopefully it won't ever happen, but we should be able to and want to. Verse 11 about judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. Second Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Luke chapter 6 also, one of my favorite. This is one of my favorite passages. Verses 37 and 38. It says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, the, will be measured back to you. I just love the end of that verse where it says, The measure that you use will be measured back to you. So just think, think about that in a visual. Think about getting to heaven and there's just measurements of how much you judge people and how much you condemned people. And think about if that was going to be pouring back and then done unto you. You know, it's kind of a hard visual to think of. And it really makes me feel bad whenever, you know, something like that happens. I think about that verse a bit, you know, the measure that I use will be measured back to me. And I don't know, that just really gets hard for me. But Jesus, Jesus was judged and he was perfect. So... There's maybe no sense of fair to that, but we do get a sense of fair and a sense of mercy, and we should be thankful for that. Back in John 16 now, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I just put a little side note here because I have heard it said, you know, like people doubt Paul. They'll say, well, that's what Paul said. I, you know, I don't know about that. But, you know, that, that's what Paul said. But here in this verse, it specifically says, I have a lot more to teach you, but you cannot now bear it. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, the Holy Spirit 
comes, he will guide you in all that's truth. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, this is Paul. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human order. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And John chapter 14 says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Advocate can also be swapped with the spirit of truth or the helper. To help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth, the word cannot accept, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. So I just think it's interesting just to say that Jesus did say that there will be a spirit of truth that comes and helps and guides and reveals stuff to people when he is gone. So just take that as you will. And in verse 14 and 15, it's really just a notice just to say how you will to tell someone is genuine and not a, false teacher, not a false teacher. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So if you hear something that is not glorifying Jesus, not the truth. You know, nothing, nothing that is said that doesn't glorify Jesus will not be of any importance to us. And that the Father has his mind, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So just to kind of wrap up, just some applications that maybe we can take and apply to our daily lives. First is that life is never and was never, it was never promised to be without hardship and fair. Hebrews chapter 12, verses three through seven, consider, it says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that, he may, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Breaking that down, it says, consider Jesus who suffered such hostility from people regardless of him being perfect but that he did that so that one day when we're struggling that we could not grow weary and faint hearted. We will be up, you know, encouraged in his story. It says in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly to the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So just, just a side note, you know, life was never promised to just be 100% perfect and easy. And we see that in the Bible and we see it everywhere. And we can be often hard, you know, some, some people's lives are harder than others, but we should all be encouraged by the story and the message that is taught to us here that this world is not permanent. It, we're not going to be here forever, but... The home that we have in heaven is permanent and eternal. And it may be hard not to focus on worldly struggles. You know, I struggle with that as well. I'm assuming everybody does. But that's not the ultimate end story for us. A lot of times when I play a video game, you know, you're, you're playing to get to the end because usually that's the best part. But the end for us is not the best part. It's what's come after the end for us is the best part, which has no end. And that should be what we're striving for and what we hope for. Secondly, focus at the task at hand. I mentioned earlier, but the disciples oftentimes got bogged down when Jesus said he was leaving that they forgot about the actual message of the story. And I think we can kind of get in that same mindset to where we focus on some stuff other than others. A lot of stuff in the Sermon on the Mount classes, you know, it comes from the heart. Jesus is teaching. You've heard that it was said, you shall not murder or you'll be liable to judgment. But I say, you should not be angry without your, with your brother without cause. I would, I would imagine if someone walked through this door right now and said, I murdered someone. And then if someone walked through the door five minutes later and said, I was angry at my brother without cause, you know, we'd be like, well, those two are not equal. But that's not what Jesus teaches. And oftentimes it gets in our head that, you know, we can make, we can, you know, judge people and we know what's worse than others. But truth is, you know, it's all the same. Sin is all the same. You know, everyone that sins, you know, sins, we all sin and fall short to the glory of God. It, it doesn't matter. You know, we need to keep, that notion first, and then everything else after. And lastly, we will never have to face more than we can bear. Uh, what verse is it? One of the verses, I, I can't find it, it's right here, but one of the verses says that Jesus has more to teach you. He has more to teach them, but more than they can now bear. You know, Jesus knew that the disciples after hearing all this was just, they were at their limit. You know, everything else he was going to teach them or he wanted to teach them at that time. And I guess there was no more time, but 
they had heard too much and they were too overwhelmed and too too bothered by what's about to happen that Jesus knew anything else he says is just going to be, you know, kind of maybe disregarded and, you know, not kept. So that's the point of the Holy Spirit that he sent to them to teach after he was gone. But at the same time, Jesus is never, or, you know, they are never going to allow us to suffer more than we can bear as well. I thought it, was, it kind of ties in well with John's invitation from Wednesday, saying that he was overwhelmed, but in hindsight, you know, my, my, my burden is small. And, you know, I think that's how more times than not, that's kind of how it is. You know, we may feel like we're just at our limit and we, we may be sometimes, but I think a lot of times we may feel like we're just maxed out and, you know, we're just at our breaking point. And if anything else goes wrong, I'm not going to be able to control myself. I played golf with John yesterday and that's how I felt about 90% of the day. I, I told Hannah, I was like, if John wasn't here, I'd be hitting the road. I'm out of here. I'm done. But, you know, truthfully, after I said that, I started playing a little better, and that's oftentimes probably realistic in how stuff goes for us. We feel like we're at a le uh, limit, and then something goes our way, and all of a sudden we're back, you know, and we're feeling good. And I think that's just a good thing, a good thing to keep in mind. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 11 says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that we will, he will deliver us again. You all also must be help us by prayer so that many of us will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted to us through prayers by many. You know, so here they say, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That truly sounds like the limit. That truly sounds like they're at the point of no more. But he says all of that was to make us not rely on ourselves and what we can do, but to rely on what God and what God can do for us. And I think that's just a beautiful message coming from people that probably experienced way worse stuff than we will ever have to, hopefully. So I hope this message has been occurring to you as much as the opportunity is to give this message has been to me. If you feel as if you're struggling with your faith and need the prayers of the church, or if you haven't claimed Jesus as the Son of God and want to do so through baptism, please come forward as we stand and sing. God can wash away.